face up and bit my neck up, like really pinned me down. And the moment he got up, he just laughed and said, well, you deserve that for not doing as you're told. And it was that point when his mum and his nan came over. And even though he made me put makeup on and I tried to cover the bruises, they, they weren't covering. It hurt the most when I got home after having a C-section and I weren't even allowed back in my own bed. I had to sleep on the sofa because he didn't want me and our daughter disturbing his sleep and his well-being was better than mine and our daughter's. He almost murdered me, uh, attempted to murder me on three different occasions. And I think it was the last one where the police, because I was like naked by that time, right? He'd beat me up, my soft tissues in my back were injured. I was literally stripped naked. There was like blood, like it was just crazy. And I remember just, you know, like in that moment where you don't even have, you don't, it's not even, like you don't have any like kind of like, I don't know what the word is, shame. Like I was literally naked running to the front door, attempting, because I was like, in this moment of time, I'm gonna die. I was almost like stabbed, almost bricked. Almost running to the river, similar to my mum, so that whole generation thing. You know, being forced to be pregnant and stuff like that. Like he would try and trap me, like he told me, I'm going to trap you so that you can't leave and you'll be with me forever. It was so bad that I had to take morning after pills to the point that the pharmacy said, we can't give you anymore. Then I started like self-harming. So I was like attempting suicide about eight times that I remember eight times of um, attempted suicide. And then I couldn't even kill myself. So I felt like a failure because I just felt like I couldn't do anything yeah, right. It hit me that day. I had like marks under my eyes, my kneecaps and things. I could barely walk, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning. He rang his mum and said like, listen, this time I'm actually gonna kill her, you need to come and get her out of my house now. He was always targeting my belly because he wanted me to have an abortion and obviously I was only 16, or just turned 17 when I found out I was pregnant and he was 25 at the time. He had told me, you know, I've made seven different girls or I've killed seven babies before, there's no way a kid's gonna have mine and things like that, so. The abuse was always very focused around my stomach and obviously trying to, like, basically kill the child and things like that. As I started getting, like, showing more and my bump was getting bigger and we had announced it, obviously I think he realised he, it's happening, the baby's coming, um, and he obviously didn't want anyone knowing what he was like and things, so that's when it just turned into a lot of suffocation and strangulation. Um, I did leave him two years ago, but the abuse didn't stop. It got worse, it got more violent. It got more intense for me um, to the point where I questioned going back because I thought the abuse was better being with him than what it was not being with him. But I definitely disassociate to life. I, if I don't want to think of it or I don't want to live it, I separate real life and I struggle to come back into reality. Using my children as human shields. It's shameful to admit I've done that a lot. I've held my babies in front of me to not be abused. <clears throat> I need people to recognise that you've got pre-abuse, you've got active abuse. Nobody ever supports you after abuse. The therapy needs to be more accessible and the wait lists are just ridiculous. And I think some people don't have a day in their life to get therapy, never mind three years. Some people, if they could get therapy, it would change or save their life. But at home, he was just, he was taking drugs. So he was, if he didn't have that fix, he was aggressive. When he did have it, he wasn't a nice person to be around either. It was, it's really hard to look back now at how he was. He just overall just, just ruined my life. Well, you've got it together, Dan. You know, you, you've, you've done the work already. You're healed, right? You're here in your whole state. And actually, I need this space as much as anybody else. I'm still a survivor. I'm still recovering. I'm still on the journey even though I've done a lot of the work and I'm much further along in the process as say someone who's going through crisis right now. Nobody outside of my immediate family calls me Daniela. Everybody else, I'm Danny Wallace. And it's not just Danny, it's Danny Wallace, unless you're like my circle of friends. And there is a distinct difference between the hat that, and it's not fake, it's just an amplified version of myself that I have in my professional facing self, right? There are very few spaces outside of that because it's so high profile. 
where I can just be Daniela again and actually reconnect with her and she's really important, she's really important to me. And You rip back another layer of the onion and you have to look at yourself a little bit more and dig a little bit deeper and find out who you are each time. So having a space like this is, it's incredible. I had suffered sexual assault. I would wake up in the middle of the night and he would be touching me. I, I thought it was normal. I thought that that's what happens in a relationship, you know, that's... I was his property, he could do what he wanted. And if he didn't get what he wanted, I, I, I would feel the repercussions of it. And he pushed me so forcefully that I fell into a cabinet. I cut all my elbow, my head whacked the, the windowsill. And as I was laying there, the only thing I could hear was my son shouting, mummy, 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 mummy. And he is the only reason I got back up that day. It had been drilled into my head for so long that I couldn't be on my own. I was a crap mum. I would never make it. I couldn't do anything. So he forced me to go for a termination. But little did he tell everyone that he had pinned me up by my neck the week before that, or that I was called every name under the sun and that I wasn't good enough. When my first daughter was a week and a half old, my C-section scar had come undone because he had grabbed the pushchair so forcefully from me in order to take her. I grabbed it back and my C-section scar came open. There isn't enough support. There definitely isn't. I went through my help in the pandemic. So there was no face to face, there was no one coming to check you were okay. There was no one to call because they were all busy. Even after the pandemic had gone, even when I would call agencies, oh, well, there's a backlog, so we'll, we'll put you on a waiting list. But I needed the help there and then. I didn't need to go on a waiting list. Oh, I'm free. I'm, I'm definitely free. I'm gone. He has no clutches on me anymore. My life is completely different. I live in a house he has never stepped foot in. I have children he no longer knows. My life is different. I have ambitions. I'm, I'm free. <laughs> You're powerful. Yeah. You reclaimed it all back for yourself and your children. I did, I did. Mm -hmm.